Hey folks, welcome to class. Today we're going to talk about The Handmaid's Tale, uh, the novel that we're reading for this class. Um, we're going to go through a few chapters and uh, <clears throat> talk about some of the high points in the text and whatnot, and also uh, do some analysis here and there. Um, before we, we move into talking about The Handmaid's Tale, though, let's let's <clears throat> remember that we need to pay attention to the rhetorical context, right? Who wrote this story? What was the situation going on as this story was being written, like in the real world? Uh, who is this text aimed after? Um, those kind of questions, right? Because being able to answer those questions will tell us a lot about um, the need for this text, the purpose, why it was written, um, and, and maybe the direction it's, it's going to go. So let's look into that now. Let's talk about the author, Margaret Atwood. <clears throat> she was born in 1939. She's still around uh, as of this recording. Uh, she's from Canada. Um, she's a novelist, essayist, poet, literary critic, environmental activist. So uh, got a, a lot of hands and a lot of pots. Um, <clears throat> her work covers a variety of topics. She's been writing for decades. Um, and uh, written tons of works, I think um, dozens at this point, 50, 60, something close to that. Um, but deals with a lot of topic, topics, including gender and identity, religion, mythology, um, power of language, the use of language, um, climate change, and uh, power politics. Um, so a lot of different topics, but all kind of connected together. Like if, if you want to, to understand why the machinery of the world works in the way it does, why, why uh, <clears throat> you know, governments make the decisions they do, why, why uh, uh, we uh, have uh, gender roles like we do in our society. She, uh, her writing touches on a lot of those things. So um, really insightful works. Um, her writing typically involves uh, female characters, and it often has to do with the uh, nature of uh, gender relationships, women and men, women and women, men and men, <clears throat> though uh, she often uh, declines the label of feminist. And one of the reasons that she says that she often declines it is simply because uh, feminism, that term isn't uh, 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 defined universally for everybody. In reality, feminism is, is just the, the um, uh, <clears throat> support of, of gender equality, basically, of treating everybody uh, uh, <clears throat> the same uh, without giving special preferences uh, to men in particular, but, but to make sure that everybody, men and women, um, are, are given an equal shake, right? That their experiences are valued um, and uh, uh, they're recognized as equal members of society. <clears throat> so feminism actually has has something to do with, with with men as well. It's not just it's not just this idea that your your racist uncle has at, that when he when he comes and visits at Thanksgiving where they just want women to to be better than men. No, that's not what feminism is. Feminism is just like hey, you know there are. Uh, uh, some people in in our societies, uh, particularly women, um, minorities as well, uh, who don't get um, the same benefit of the doubt, the same consideration, the same privileges that uh, uh, other people do, particularly people that look like me, white males, um, and they want to make to make that equal for everybody, not by bringing anybody down, but by raising everybody up. <clears throat> of course. Your racist uncle has a has a different view on that, and because of that, and because there are a lot of people like that, um, uh, Margaret Atwood, oftentimes, you know, she feels iffy about that term feminist, simply because to some people it's a loaded word. But if you know what the word actually means, if you know what the movement is about, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's 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 not particularly controversial. It's it's not trying to take anything away from anybody. It's just trying to make sure that everybody can uh, uh, be treated equally and fairly. So um, you'll hear sometimes her writing is is feminist literature, uh, and and sometimes she'll agree, sometimes she won't, depending on on how she feels, I guess. But um, but most of her works, many of her works, I should say. Um, deal with uh, uh, women's issues, women's struggles. So, 
I also recognize I'm not a woman. Um, and I want to preface what we're going to talk about in all of this uh, with the fact that I recognize that I'm uh, just by the nature of, of, of my sex, I'm going to be uh, uh, mansplaining a lot of these things. And I, you know, that, that there's only so much I can do. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, we're we're going to talk about the text itself. We're going to talk about um, uh, how, how the text uh, uh, applies to the real world. Otherwise, why write stories if they don't apply, you know, to the, to the real world, if they're just fantasy. Um, and I'm going to do that uh, in the best way I can as an ally, but um, I recognize and I want you to recognize that I recognize that I'm, I, I don't have many of these experiences that women have uh, uh, myself and I can't. So uh, I don't know if I should actually need to apologize for that. My experiences are just what they are. But at the same time, I want you to recognize that I'm, I'm going to be doing the best I can with the tools I have. Uh, uh, so, so please, uh, keep that in mind. Cut me some slack. Uh, uh, uh take what I say with a, a grain of salt. And, and if you have feedback to give, absolutely. When we, when, when you post, uh, when you see these videos posted or assignments based on them, give some feedback, help each other out <clears throat> in your, in your classes. Uh, you guys have experiences with, with what we're going to be talking about in many ways, uh, uh, uh more significant then I, I will or have, so uh, uh, feedback is good for this particular type of thing. Anyway, as far as um, her education, she received her master's degree at Radcliffe College. Uh, she's published, as I said, dozens of books of poetry, fiction, nonfiction, um, and pursued a doctorate at Harvard in Boston, Massachusetts. In fact, um, The Handley's Tale is set in Boston, and some of its events take place directly on Harvard campus and uh, interesting. I, I've been to Harvard and uh, it, it's not what you would think. It's smaller than you than you think, strangely enough. Um, <clears throat> but some of the places she mentions, the library and whatnot, I've actually been there and I get to go, ooh, I've been there. Uh, except except the book's not particularly an upbeat book. So it's not like, hey, I've been there because <laughs> there's like a mass murder going on at the time. And so uh, in the book. And so that's not really one of those things you think at the time. Anyway, so um, that's Margaret Atwood. Let's talk about the book. So it was published in 1985. So, so, uh, where, where are we at here? About 40 years ago at this point. Um, it's a dystopian novel. It's an important word, uh, set in Massachusetts and it kind of takes place in the near future. So probably around now is, you know, whatever, whatever 1985's idea of now is, is, or uh, was, is, is probably what it is. Um, and in this near future world, the United States has been overthrown um, and a totalitarian fundamentalist theocracy, which is government by religion named Gilead has taken its place. Now, uh, a, a brief thing, uh, the word dystopia comes from the word utopia and utopia itself is actually a relatively new word. It really came into existence um, during the 1500s. Um, <clears throat> and a utopia is a perfect society where everybody's equal and happy and they've, they've got all their problems solved. Um, in fact, the U, the U in uh, utopia is the same root as the U in Uber. And it just means best or ultimate, right? So when you when you take an Uber, that word just means best. It's just German. Um, <clears throat> anyway, topia means place. So uh, if you uh, guys, isn't there isn't there a game or something called Petopia or whatever? It's a place for your pets, right? You, you get the idea. All right. Um, anyway, um, so a utopia is the best place, right? And, and that word actually came about thanks to the Renaissance through the scientific and cultural and artistic advancements made during the Renaissance. Uh, a lot of people's lives changed positively and people started speculating, huh, maybe we can, maybe we can perfect this thing. Maybe we can make a perfect society. So they would write stories about utopias. Um, one of the first ones being called Utopia, I think it was written in 1516, something like that. Um, anyway, couple hundred years later, uh, dystopian literature came about. 
um, that particular term. Um, it appeared much later, it can be traced to early reactions to the social upheaval caused by the French Revolution and, and the American Revolution. Those happened about at the same time where people decided, you know what, all these kings and this whole, this whole idea of there being people just born better than everybody else and being able to just tell, you know, push the 99% around if you want to use modern kind of terms. We don't like that. We think that everybody uh, should be able to get somewhere through their own work, through their own merit. Uh, uh, you guys need to stop that. And the kings and queens are like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. And the people are like, oh, well, sorry, your heads are off. And as you might imagine, when you get rid of the heads of state that way, literally and figuratively, uh, uh, there's a lot of, of cultural upheaval. When you go from being ruled by uh, kings and queens to being ruled by literally the first real democracies and republics, um, there's a big a lot of big changes, right? A lot of bad things happen. A lot of a lot of people go out of business. A lot of people die. Um, you know, uh, the the existing order crumbles, and because all of that stuff was happening, um, people started writing about the worst of all possible worlds, right? Dis, uh, D Y S, right? Meaning meaning bad, or or uh, worse, or or terrible. A dystopia is the worst place you could possibly imagine, right? So, um, starting around you know early 1800s, like with Gulliver's Travels, for example, Gulliver's Travels is just a giant allegory um, for how bad humanity was in the early 1800s. Um, but uh, starting there, we started to see stories about utopias, or sorry, dystopias, and we see those. We see modern ones now, right? Um, uh, 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 the Walking Dead, right? It's a zombie dystopian world. Mad Max um, uh, is another sort of dystopian world, right? Where there's no where there's no water. Everybody's fighting over you know scraps of what was left from the previous world, gasoline stuff like that. Um, um, <clears throat> oh, what's that one with Katniss? You know, the one with Katniss. Um, those are all dystopian worlds. And many times when writers write about these dystopias, it's because uh, by showing us the worst possible world, we see painful connections, painful parallels with our own world. A lot of the things, uh, if you've already started reading um, The Handmaid's Tale, a lot of the things that, that occur in this story are things that actually occur already or have occurred um, either in our country or in, in another country. In fact, if you go to the uh, uh, introduction, I think there's something um, valid here because remember, uh, Atwood grew up right after World War II, right? So uh, leaving the, the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust and then moving into um, the new uh, era of the Cold War and whatnot and uh, uh, fear, uh, fear mongering of, uh, of communism and socialism and, and all those kind of things and um, uh, saw uh, firsthand these totalitarian governments and, and how they functioned. Um, I'm trying to find, I thought I had the page marked, but uh, here we go. <clears throat> Uh, where she talks about where this book came from. Um, and I'll, I'll read to you just the first part of this introduction because it, I, I think it tells us a lot about, about where this story is going to go and what we can expect of it. She wrote this forward um, in 2017, actually, right after the, uh, the, the presidential election. So um, uh, about the time that the, uh, uh, the, the TV show version of this was coming out, she wrote this forward for new editions of, um, of The Handmaid's Tale. In the spring of 1984, I began to write a novel that was not initially called The Handmaid's Tale. I wrote in longhand, mostly on yellow uh, legal notepads, then transcribed my almost illegible scrawlings using a huge German keyboard manual typewriter that I had rented. <clears throat> the keyboard was German because I was living in West Berlin, which was still circled by the Berlin Wall. 
the Soviet Empire was still strongly in place and was not to crumble for another five years. Every Sunday, the East German Air Force made sonic booms to remind us of how close they were. During my visits to several countries behind the Iron Curtain, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, uh, I experienced the wariness, the feeling of being spied on, the silences, the changes of subject, the oblique ways in which people might convey information, and these had an influence on what I was writing. So did the repurposed buildings. This used to belong to, but then they disappeared. I heard such stories many times. Having been born in 1939 and come to consciousness during World War II, I knew that established orders could vanish overnight. Change could be as fast as lightning. It can't happen here, could not be depended on. Anything could happen anywhere, given the circumstances. By 1984, I've been avoiding my novel for a year or two. It seemed to me a risky venture. I'd read extensively in science fiction, speculative fiction, utopias, and dystopias ever since my high school years in the 1950s, but I'd never written such a book. Was I up to it? The form was strewn with pitfalls, among them a tendency to sermonize, a veering into allegory, and a lack of plausibility. This is true. For a lot of speculative fiction, especially when you have a, a theme, an important theme that you want to get across, ineffective writers sometimes just end up coming out and saying, having a character come out and say what the point of the story is. And as we've discussed, that really kind of damages the story. If you have a whole chapter where some dude comes up and talks about the importance of fighting against the state, oh, well, I could have just read that part instead of the whole story. That's Ayn Rand for you, for example. Um, you read any of her books and there's always this giant monologue, which was just uh, her theoretical beliefs anyway. You could have just read that instead of the story. So that's the kind of danger uh, uh, that um, Atwood is talking about. A tendency to sermonize, veering into allegory, a lack of plausibility. If I was to create an imaginary garden, I wanted the toads on it to be real. One of my rules was that I would not put any events into the book that had not already happened in what James Joyce called the nightmare of history, nor any technology not already available. No imaginary gizmos, <clears throat> no imaginary laws, no imaginary atrocities. God is in the details, they say. So is the devil. So what we're going to read here is, is Atwood's best attempt to tell us a story um, using events that either are currently happening or already have happened as uh, uh, backdrops. And uh, in theory, none of what you're going to read, the characters are different, the particular events are different, but none of the things that happen have never happened before in human history. These are all things in this book that we're going to read about that humanity has done to itself at one point uh, or continues to do. <clears throat> and it's not just uh, some other country, some other time period. Many of these things are still happening uh, right now, today, and in our country. So uh, uh, there's... Uh, and there are important messages in this book, ones that we can that we can take to heart, ones that have meaning outside of just with the characters in the text. And that's why we're reading it. There's there's some value here. Uh, it might help us see uh, our own world a little more clearly. So let's go ahead and move into talking about the actual text. <clears throat> so in chapter one. We start off uh, in a high school gymnasium, and it looks like it's been converted to hold prisoners, right? Everybody's kind of quiet and whispering to one another. Um, and the gym is clearly old, and we know it's old. And here's where we get to talk about some figurative language. We've been talking about description, um, and your first essay is about describing uh, a location. Look at some of the descriptive language in the text here. The gym's old, right? We know it's old. But nowhere in in the text does our writer, does, sorry, does does Atwood just come out and say the gym is old. Instead, what she does, she uses figurative language. In this case, I think it's a metaphor um, to show you just how old the uh, the gym is. Um, if you look on page three, <clears throat> let's see that first, the very first paragraph. We're getting a lot of a lot of exposition already. We're going to learn a lot about this, this area already in just a few sentences. 
We slept in what had once been the gymnasium. The floor was of varnished wood, with stripes and circles painted on it for the games that were formerly played there. The hoops for the basketball nets were still in place, though the nets were gone. A balcony ran around the room for the spectators, and I thought I could smell, faintly like an after-image, the pungent scent of sweat, shot through with the sweet taint of chewing, uh, chewing gum and perfume from the watching girls, felt skirted as I knew from pictures, later in miniskirts, then pants, then in one earring, spiky green hair, green streaked hair. So what's going on there? Well, she's talking about the different eras of students that had been in this in this gym, right? Felt skirted, as I knew from pictures. Later, mini skirts, that sounds like the 60s, then pants, 70s, uh, earring, spiky green streaked hair, so 80s, punk, right? And considering this was written in the 80s, uh, uh, that's about as far forward as she was willing to go in time, right? We also get an idea of the of the uh, uh, of the author's age because uh, she knows felt skirts only from pictures. I should say I don't, don't say I mean author, I mean the narrator's age because she knows uh, that women wore felt skirts only from seeing pictures, right? Which means that she didn't experience that herself. Older people did. So those skirts were common on students in the 1950s. It's likely our narrator was a high school teenager sometime in the 50s or 60s. And in fact, um, it seems Atwood is writing contemporaneously, right? She herself was 17 uh, in 1965. So we know at least that this gym has been around since the 50s, right? So nothing in here in that first paragraph that I read said the gym was old or the gym had been around from the 50s. Instead, we get, instead of that telling, we get a showing. She shows us mental images of, of uh, uh, girls in this gym starting off <clears throat> in um, uh, uh, <clears throat> felt skirts, then mini skirts, then pants, then with spiky green hair, right? It's like a montage. And that's an example of, of descriptive language, of, of the use of figurative language to convey an idea without having to come out and tell us it directly. And by doing that, we get to experience the thing instead of just being told about it and expected to, to follow along. It's a lot more evocative. It's a lot more easy to connect with that text when it shows us instead of just tells us, right? It also appears that the United States is gone, right? We had flannelette sheets like children's and army issued blankets, old ones that still said the United States. Huh. Well, if the United States still existed, why, why would it be surprising to see the U.S. on military blank blankets? It's more likely that the U.S. doesn't exist anymore. And the fact that the blankets you have still said U.S. on them was the surprising thing. So these are old blankets, too. And uh, chances are there's no more United States. Okay, so we've got some people in this room, in this gym, uh, uh, and uh, they're on cots, and they've been issued, you know, whatever few materials they've been issued to, to stay on these cots. And the prisoners um, also seem uh, to be all women, right? Uh, they eventually talk about using their bodies to escape, right? Of being of being ex of exchanging something to seduce the guards and escape. I think it says, if only we could talk to them, something could be ex exchanged. We still had our bodies. Considering most relationships are heterosexual, uh, and the guards we learned uh, in the paragraph earlier than the one I just mentioned uh, are male then uh, uh, these are almost likely entirely female prisoners. Okay, so now we've got a, a solid idea of where we are. We're in a gym, probably modern day, at least when this text was written, uh, because we go through all the different types of clothing that girls wore in previous generations. Um, we're, being, uh, uh, we're being watched over 
by women called ants, right? And an ant is always a female member of the family. Your your uh, uh, aunt or, or sorry, your um your parents' sisters, right? Those are your those are your ants. So so those are likely women. They're capitalized though, so that seems like an ant is a title of some sort, right? Like certain types of citizens are called ants. And then the ants themselves are overseen by angels, right? By the, the guards were angels. So uh, interesting sort of strata that we've got here. We've got the prisoners, we've got the um, the ants, and then we've got the, the angels. So let, let's keep that in mind as we, we go along because this is an entirely new world, really, an imaginary world that has to get built. So we're going to get a lot of exposition. Uh, but notice, the thing that I think is really interesting and, and I think is very, um, uh, 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 that, that shows to the strength of Atwood's writing, there's never a point in time where she comes out and directly tells us all of these things. There's no narrator that booms across the sky and tells us, here's the world as you see it now, right? This isn't the beginning of Lord of the Rings where, where uh, 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 Galadriel has to explain to us 500 years of, of the ring. Uh, no, instead... We are kind of dropped into this situation. It's called, to, when, it, when a story starts that way, it's called in situ res. Um, James Bond movies start that way where he's already just first five minutes, he's fighting, you know, Nazis or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, we're, we're dropped in and we're expected to be a little confused, right? Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about this world and, and Atwood knows that. And she's giving us little bits at a time, not only so we can understand the text, but also because it is a confusing world that we've been dropped into, right? This gives us a, a feeling maybe of what 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 these people are actually going through. These the, the people who are the uh, the the prisoners here. So, like I said, it appears that the prisoners' captors are women. We've got Aunt Sarah and Aunt Elizabeth. So we've got some new characters that we've met. But these ants seem to be themselves overseen by guards. Uh, and uh, only the guards can be trusted with guns, right? And these guards are, are clearly male. So it seems like we're in some sort of world where, where women by default, even when they have positions of authority like the ants do, they're not allowed firearms. Hmm. So we've got a patriarchy, right? It seems like already where men have a, a higher status, men are running things and women are just kind of, well, you know, they're women. So the guards are trusted with guns. The ants only get cattle prods, but the ants use those cattle prods on our prisoners, right? So we've got, again, that strata uh, uh, in society uh, and we're trying to just kind of build that in our head. You might want to write those kind of things down and just start making a mental note of, of uh, who's got the power in this particular situation. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're reading a book and some books are complicated and some books, uh, you know, require us to 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 uh, think about things or remember a lot of things. So so there's nothing wrong with taking notes. And in fact, if you look at uh, some of my text, I actually take notes directly on the page. Um, it's easy because then I don't have to look somewhere else and then go back to the book to find the part I was talking about. I just look right at the book and I see the, the notes that I've taken. So feel free to, to do that. It's a very helpful uh, reading technique that we've talked about, in fact, um, for understanding this, this text. So we've got our a few members of society that we understand right now. We've got our prisoners, whoever they are. We've got our ants and we've got our, our angels. Um, those angels, uh, uh, specially chosen from them are our actual guards. Um, and it seems like the angels, uh, that's another type of, uh, uh, citizen. Well, maybe it's not a citizen though, right? Maybe it's a, a military member. It seems like the angels are soldiers, right? So, uh, we, we also learn that the angels, uh, probably are the, the soldiers of whatever government it is that's running things that's no longer the United States. Now, while we're here in this first chapter, I want to want you guys to note the language that's used, right? We've got lengthy descriptive sentences with lots of expressive, evocative words, right? Just that first paragraph you remember that I read to you, um, 
paints a really vivid scene, right? It allows the writer to put in by, by, by showing those, those images, as I was explaining instead of telling you, it allows the writer to put into your head a lot of ideas without having to explicitly describe what's going on. Pay attention because that's how this entire first chapter is written. It's going to change in just a second. By the way, vocabulary note. Um, when the uh, ants are um, carrying, or when the, the ants' uh, uh, cattle prods are hanging around their waist from thongs, a thong is just a strap of cloth or leather or something like that. That's the traditional uh, meaning of thong. If you think about like underwear, that's just a relatively new meaning. And the reason it's called a thong is, well, you can figure that part out, right? Um, in Great Britain, um, sandals, flip-flops are called thongs because they have that one strap. So, um, yeah, thong is an older word than the underwear version of thong. So uh, uh, don't 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 get twisted on on that particular term. I thought I would point that out for those who who may not be uh, familiar with the the um, original or, or, or traditional use of thong. So now let's get into chapter two. And as we begin chapter two, look at the style of the language used now and note how it's changed. Uh, a chair, a table, a lamp. Above on the white ceiling, a relief ornament in the shape of a wreath. And in the center of it, a blank space plastered over like the place in a face where the eye has been taken out. There must have been a chandelier once. They've removed anything you could tie a rope to. Oof. That sounds pretty bad, right? Sounds like somebody had hung themselves from that chandelier. They pulled the chandelier down and patched over the hole, and it looks like an eye taken out. Man, for that to be like four sentences, we learned a lot about the world just from those four sentences, right? And brutally so. Notice how short the sentences are. They're still expressive because our writer is a good writer and, and knows how to, how to choose words that have, have visceral meanings to us. But instead now the narrator relies almost entirely on short, simple sentences uh, and, 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 and uh, quick descriptions, but brutal imagery. As I was saying, the narrator describes the space in the ceiling above her where the chandelier used to be like the place in a face where the eye has been taken out. This is more of that figurative language, that exact type of thing that I'm asking you guys to uh, build into your first essays when you describe your location. In this case, it's a simile, right? And a simile is where you compare two things using the phrase like or as. If you listen to a lot of hip hop, a lot of rap, half of those things are, are similes, right? Half of the lines there are, are similes. And this one, is clearly designed to create an unpleasant image in the reader's head, right? Uh, our narrator isn't just looking up and going, huh, the uh, ceiling above me is really ugly. There's a big plaster uh, uh, patch in the ceiling where there used to be a chandelier. You could say that, or you could say it like it's a face where the eye has been taken out. Hmm. That's a much more uh, evocative image, right? You imagine a, a gouged out eye in someone's face and that's not, a, a, that's not a particularly pleasant image. And so through that language, and it doesn't take any more words to make that description than it does to literally describe the ceiling, our author is able to show us right, is to make us feel something about that ceiling instead of just be able to visualize that ceiling. There's that showing, not telling. So I wanted to point that out because this book is full of figurative language, and it's important to note when we see that figurative language because language loaded with meaning is how good writers put meaning into their stories. Yeah, there's the things that literally happen in the story, but there's also the way that this stuff is described. And the way a character is described, the language that they use, the way a scene uh, is described, those kind of things. Uh, good writers use that description 
to tell us about these locations or these characters or these events. So it's particularly important to read this stuff closely. And don't just kind of skim through the description. The descriptionism is as important as actually what's happening in the story. We're not supposed to like this room. We, we also know that our narrator, who is a prisoner, does not like this room. And uh, uh, that there's a lot of, uh, we're already talking about like physical violence where the eye has been taken out, uh, removing, removing anything you can tie a rope to, so suicide. We're already getting um, a kind of a running uh, uh, set of images of violence and death, right? And maybe that's not one of those things that you think in, uh, you know, in, in, in direct words in your head. But that's why we're stopping and talking about it now. I'm sure that you got that feeling as you read the story. But maybe if I asked you about it without us talking about it, you'd be like, uh, I don't know. It just seemed like, you know, it was a, a bad place to be. Exactly. And nowhere in this, in this text does the narrator go, I don't like how I live. She doesn't have to. That's the power of, of figurative language. That's the, the power of, of showing and not telling. Anyway, clearly our narrator is still somehow a captive, but now she's in a house instead of a gym. And it seems some time has passed. In fact, we learn uh, it's probably been a few years um, later on. It appears that many previous captives have committed suicide. Um, she talks about opening up um, an escape in yourself using the glass from mirrors, which is why they don't have window or, or, or uh, mirrors in the house, or at least breakable ones, right? So whatever situation she's in, these types of prisoners are in, are ones that are so bad that suicide seems a viable option. So uh, we're not sure what their, what their life is like yet, what they have to do or what happens to them yet, but um, apparently it's pretty bad. The narrator soon shows us the reason behind her simple sentences, and this is on page eight. Uh, let's see if I can find it. I cannot, I do have the, the uh, quote here though. Um, like other things, thoughts must be rationed. So it's smarter not to sit and think about your situation for too long, right? If you just think in short, simple sentences and get your work done every day or whatever and keep your head down, uh, keep your thoughts short and, and to the point, it helps you stay out of trouble. So that explains the change in our language, going from longer, expressive sentences to short, very uh, structured, descriptive sentences that when they do provide description are, are, are pretty uh, uh, unflinching, pretty brutal uh, in, in how, how, uh, how they describe things. So um, that's a pretty big change, right? We get the idea that something has happened to the narrator to make her go from the type of person who would describe things as she did in chapter one to describing things as she's going to be be for the rest of the book. In chapter two, we also learn of a new character, Aunt Lydia. She'll play a, a reasonable role in the story. She tells the narrator to think about her captivity as being in the army and to consider where she's at, quote, not a privilege, not a prison, but a privilege. It's not really clear yet if Aunt Lydia actually believes what she's saying, but Aunt Lydia is always the, the person in the story that seems to, uh, treat these prisoners who we're going to find out are, are, are called handmaids. Um, so I'll go ahead and use that term so I don't have to keep saying prisoner. Um, that uh, she actually, she at least speaks, Aunt Lydia does, uh, like the handmaids are uh, uh, precious commodities, not the uh, prisoners that they clearly are. But anyway, right now, uh, and even for a long while, it's unclear whether or not Aunt Lydia actually believes the things she's saying, which is, I think, why uh, uh, our, our narrator says that Aunt Lydia is in love with either or. Yeah, it's a good way to put that, I think. 
The narrator declares her desire to outlast the current situation that she's in. And this is important. Whenever you hear a character state something unequivocally, like they've stopped and they're looking at the camera and uh, uh, they're telling you something and they're telling you something directly, even if they're not talking to you directly, they might be talking to another character or something like that. Whenever you hear a, a, a direct declarative statement said right to the, to the, to the, the reader or to the camera, it's one of those things you should pay attention to. And here's what we have uh, here on the top of page eight where um, our narrator does that. A bed, single, mattress, medium hard, covered with a flocked white spread. Nothing takes place in the bed but sleep or no sleep. Huh, so no sex on the bed. Huh, interesting, what kind of world are we in? I try not to think too much. Like other things, thought must be rationed. There's a lot now that doesn't bear thinking about thinking can hurt your chances, and I intend to last. That's an interesting declaration, isn't it? She's not saying I'm gonna bring this place down. She's not saying I'm going to fit in as best I can. Her goal is to weather through these events, not succumb to them, but also not necessarily to, to fight to them, uh, fight against them. In her head, this is temporary. She can outlast this. I wonder if that's true. I wonder how many people uh, who get uh, caught up in a regime change when we go from democracy to a more totalitarian type government like uh, Iran back in 1979, uh, the revolution there. I wonder if there's still somebody there who's going, you know what, any time now, this is all gonna be over. It's been oh, you know, 45 years, dude. Uh, uh, you might want to do something about it if you want there to be change. But um, we have a tendency to tell ourselves that things are going to work out in the end, especially as we're young, because many of the stories we've been told do work out in the end. But in real life, that's not how things work necessarily, right? You got to you gotta hustle. You got to work to make things work out. And sometimes no matter what you do, bad things happen to you, right? That's that's just how life works. And so it's interesting to see that Alfred, whoops, <laughs> that's the name of our character, uh, our narrator, um, still obviously has some hope that things are going to get better because she doesn't say, I'm gonna fight this place and bring it down. She thinks, you know what, this thing is temporary. I'm going to outlast it. I intend to last. Let's see if, let's see if she keeps that attitude through the story. Let's see if that changes as we, we, we get through uh, uh, chapter after chapter. But that's important to, to pay attention to. So, it, to, so anytime uh, uh, a character comes out and says something like that where it feels like they're talking directly to you, mark that down. Because usually there's an important uh, uh, point there to note. Either, either this is what the character was like before all the bad things happened, or um, it, it, it's, it's a good moment of characterization tells us a little bit about that character. Now, we get more of this same I intend to last stuff uh, later on the same page. She's talking about her room. She says the door of the room, not my room, I refuse to say my, is not locked. Well here, why would she refuse to accept the room as hers? Well, it shows that she's unwilling to accept the situation she's been put in, right? If someone makes you a prisoner and says, that's your room, and you say, no, that's a room. My room is over there, you know, in, in my hometown where I live. That's my cell. That's a big difference from just accepting that room is yours, isn't it? So we already see that she's not trying to fight back necessarily, but she's definitely not a willing participant. She does, in fact, intend to last. And part of that lasting isn't just physically, but it's up here, right? It's, it's, it's not losing yourself to whatever type of person it seems like this country wants her to be. So we move on. Our narrator goes down the, the stairs and she sees herself in a mirror and it's kind of a, a, a rounded mirror to prevent itself from being broken. And because of that, it distorts uh, the image, the image that you see, right? And uh, what she says she sees, um, in fact, she she says that the fish, the the mirror itself, looks like a fish's a uh, fish eye, right? This is on page nine. 
There remains a mirror on the hall wall. If I turn my head so that the white wings framing my face direct my vision towards it, I can see it as I go down the stairs, round, convex, a pier glass, like the eye of a fish, and myself in it like a distorted shadow. Hmm. Not a particularly positive image, is it? First of all, the eye of a fish, you think kind of glassy and oily looking, not particularly attractive. If you're trying to compliment someone, you don't go, your eyes look just like a fish that I see at the at the market. No, right? That that's usually not gonna that's not gonna get you get you points probably, unless unless I guess you're dating mermaids. I don't know. Um, but um, we get the idea that uh, she she is unhappy with her appearance. She says she feels a bit like Red Riding Hood, basically, right? About to walk into danger. A parody of something, some fairy tale figure in a red cloak descending towards a moment of carelessness that is the same as danger. If you're a woman, I wonder if that's true. Is being careless for a moment the same thing as being in danger? You walk down the wrong alley, you wear the wrong clothes, quote unquote, because, you know, men are, are somehow believed to be unable to control themselves. A sister dipped in blood. So we're actually going to get a number of references to blood um, throughout the throughout the uh, the text. I believe I don't know if it's in this section or not. There's a point where she says um, that she is defined by blood, and I wonder if that's true. Are women are women defined by blood? There's certain uh, 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 elements of a woman's life, menstruation and whatnot, that. Uh, uh, involve blood, right? Childbirth as well. It's kind of a taboo subject to talk about, but should it be? These are all natural parts of, of the human experience, right? Guys don't have a problem talking about uh, uh, pretty much anything that comes out of their bodies, and yet uh, uh, we kind of vilify women uh, in that regard, right? No, you're supposed to be dainty and, and cute and, and helpless and, and, and those sorts of things, says the patriarchy. And the moment we start talking about blood, we're like, mm, I don't know, that seems awfully unfeminine. Maybe we shouldn't talk about those things. And yet, there's so many references to, uh, to women and blood <clears throat> particularly in the text. So pay attention to that. Uh, there may be some, some symbolism that we, that we see here. So we also learn, we're still in the exposition, we're going to be here for a while, um, learning new things about this world. We learn that the various classes in society are color-coded, right? <clears throat> we also learn of a couple of new classes. There's commanders, commanders' wives, and Martha's. Note a couple of things. First of all, the commander is the person that runs the house, right? Essentially, the man of the house. What we get the idea that, that a commander is male, uh, mostly also because there's the commander's wives. But notice that they don't have their own title, like Regis or Captain or Queen or anything like that. Instead, the commander's wives are just, their title is just the commander's wife. And so this strongly implies that the wives don't have any power of their own, right? They don't have the same power that the commanders do. Their power comes entirely from their connection to their commander. Otherwise, the commander's wives would have equal titles, right? So even here, even when we're talking about the wives of the, 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 the man of the house, even their power is obviously limited, right? It's clearly below his. And then we have Martha's. And Martha is a, is a character from the Bible. She's the one preparing food and cleaning, doing chores while her, while her younger sister is listening to Jesus preach in their home. It's funny because that Martha gets kind of mad. She's like, look, why don't you help me serve everybody? I'm doing a lot of work here. And Jesus comes up and he's like, no, it's okay. She's listening to me. Well, well, aren't you, aren't you awfully hoity-toity, Jesus? Somebody feels pretty important. I always thought that was a particularly funny scene. I'm like... You know, Jesus, you could probably help out too, but yeah, all right, we'll just let that go, son of God. There, that's Martha from the Bible. And so Martha is essentially 
uh, a housekeeper, right? So if you are a Martha, uh, uh, you are the biblical Martha, the one from the Bible. You are a housekeeper. The Marthas wear green. They wear these concealing dresses with built-in aprons. So they're ready to, to get to work, right? Cooking or cleaning or whatever. Um, so we've got another biblical reference. We've already talked about angels, right? So it seems that the, the church and the government are intertwined. We're getting a lot of, of biblical references, aren't we? Our narrator's color is red, right? I, sh I forgot to mention the, 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 um, the commander's wife's color is blue. The commander's colors are black, right? Um, anyway, uh, the narrator's color, the handmaid's color, is red. Huh, like the color of blood, interestingly enough. We'll come back. Though we don't yet know uh, exactly what the class of, of people are called. They're called handmaids. We'll just start calling it that from here on. Um, her daily clothing is this red concealing dress, right? She's got like a, a nun's habit uh, uh, thing going on. Got the white wings and the veil over her face. So it kind of works like blinders, like a horse's blinders. You can kind of only see in front of you. Keeps people from being able to see your face, right? So it, it helps you say chaste and pure because we cover you up. They wear these full, uh, these full length arm gloves, right? You can't see any of their body except their face. And only then if you're looking straight at them one on one. So by hiding a woman's body, we get to uh, stop that temptation, I guess. But by doing that, we also uh, 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 blame women for being tempting, aren't we? Instead of the real, the real problem here, which is uh, uh, men, you know, using their strength or whatever to take advantage. We'll get back to that eventually. Anyway, this stuff covers her entire body. Um, she and the other uh, handmaids, we can assume, probably don't or can't possess property. We know that, too, because uh, the umbrella she references, that she's talking about the umbrella stand, and she talks about all the colors of umbrellas that are for each member of the household. Her umbrella is assigned to her, right? So, again, notice by reading closely, and we do have to read closely and carefully, we learn a lot about what's going on in this story. But just as any good story, the, the narrator isn't going to come out and give you like an Excel sheet of how all the different classes uh, uh, in this world uh, line up. They're not going to give you a bullet point list, a five paragraph essay of everybody's role in uh, in this world because this is a story, not an essay. And so we learn this information like someone is telling us a story. And sometimes part of that story will be just a, a figurative language. It'll be just a description of something. But through that description, like the umbrella assigned to our narrator, we learn things that that aren't being told to us explicitly. Okay, so handmaids can't own property, huh? Because otherwise, why could they not own umbrellas but be able to own anything else? No, they can't own anything. So definitely, definitely prisoners, perhaps slaves. So um, another example of, of ways that we're learning things uh, about the story, about the characters, without the narrator coming out and directly telling us that. And you can already see how emotionally evocative this description is, right? It's creating um, kind of a mysterious, scary world. And it makes us uh, want to know more about what's happening here. That's the nature of, of using this expressive language as opposed to just uh, uh, explicit, boring descriptions. Now, uh, do take note of the colors as you read. Um, just as blood is commonly referenced through the story, so too are colors. And in fact, so are flowers and fruit. We'll, get to, we'll talk about those things uh, soon enough, too. Uh, many times those colors are paired with specific events in the story and may give those events um, additional meaning. 
So um, pay attention to all those kind of things. Whenever you have a moment where our narrator or something in the story um, uh, brings up a, uh, an image of something that you've seen before in the story, like colors or fruit or flowers or um, blood, mark that down somewhere. Take some notes uh, because eventually we are getting tested on this. And uh, it's it's good to be able to to go back and 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 look at these these uh, recurring images, maybe these symbols, and uh, and pay it and maybe look, figure out what they mean. So we we meet two specific people, Martha's, um, Cora and Rita, and they're discussing what appears to be our narrator's role in the house, whatever handmaids do in the house. And Rita seems to think it's a pretty easy task, right? While uh, it's, but it's also debasing and beneath her, she would never do it. Um, however, uh, uh, Cora is not so sure. Let's look at this text real quick. It's on, it's on page 10. Uh, Sometimes I listen outside closed doors, a thing I never would have done in the time before. I don't listen long because I don't want to be caught doing it. Once, though, I heard Rita say to Cora that she wouldn't debase herself like that. Hmm. What kind of activity can women do that that people commonly say debase them? Is there something that a woman does in, in modern day society that some people would go, oh, that that really you've really lowered yourself? It's sex, isn't it? I wonder if they're talking about sex. Let's see. Once, though, I heard Rita say to Cora that she wouldn't debase herself like that. Nobody asking you, Cora said. Anyways, what could you do, supposing? Go to the colonies, Rita said. They have the choice. Would the unwomen and starve to death and Lord knows what all, said Cora, catch you? So it sounds like whatever it is that they're asking the handmaids to do, you either do it or you end up in the colonies, whatever that is, and you are declared an unwoman which sounds like something that you call someone that you're not counting as a person anymore, right? Mm. Okay, so it doesn't really sound like they do have much of a choice, right? It sounds like you go to like some sort of work colony or something and you're considered an unperson if you don't do whatever it is that the handmaids are supposed to do that somehow also debases you. I don't know how uh, being forced to do something debases you but uh, apparently uh, Rita doesn't seem to have a, any problem looking down on what the handmaids do, even though the handmaids are clearly slaves. So, now I just said that here. Clearly Rita and Cora find our narrator's role distasteful or scandalous, though they obviously know that the narrator is a literal prisoner with no ability to, to say no, right? She has no agency. And in fact, now that we look at it, we know that they're talking about sex and childbirth. If you go, if you keep reading, they were shelling peas even through the almost closed door. I could hear the light chink of the hard peas falling into the metal bowl. I heard Rita a grunt or a sigh of protest or agreement. Anyways, they're doing it for us all, said Cora, or so they say. If I hadn't have gotten my tubes tied, it could have been me. Say I was ten years younger. It's not that bad. It's not what you'd call hard work. Tubes tied. So wait, if we're talking about sex, are they using these handmaids? Are they having sex with these handmaids to, to make children? If I had that, let's see, they're doing it for us all. Is there some problem with like the birth rate nowadays? Are they using handmaids to uh, uh, to have babies? Why why handmaids and not not all women? Why are they enslaving handmaids? Lots of questions being brought up all of a sudden. And again, none of that is made explicit in the text. It's simply brought up in a conversation. So again, uh, it's our narrator uh, or it's our writer building, building this world, right? Causing us to ask more questions. Other odds and ends we learn at the, the, during this part of the, of the chapter, still in the exposition. Um, there's not a lot of reading going on, right? Rita gives the narrator coupons to get groceries, but there's no words on them. So that's interesting. No reading, at least not yet, it seems. 
And also, either rationing of some sort is going on, or the government owns everything, including businesses. There's no private business anymore. And we know this is the case because there's not money, right? They're not using money to buy stuff. They're using what look like government-issued coupon books. You tear out a coupon, you go to the store, you get what's on that coupon. So totalitarian government, uh, no private business. Government owns everything. So uh, uh, pretty bleak. We also learned that the Marthas are how gossip gets transmitted from house to house. There's not a regular news source that's trustworthy, it seems. So to learn anything about what's going on in the world, you have to rely on kind of the, the, the grapevine, right? The, the Marthas network in the houses. Our narrator has to rely on those little bits of information being passed down from house to house. And even then, most of that gossip has to do with children and babies. Look at look at what we what we hear about some of the gossip. The Marthas know things. They talk about themselves passing the unofficial news from house to house. Like me, they listen at doors, no doubt, and see things even with their eyes averted. I've heard them at it sometimes, caught whiffs of their private conversations. Stillborn it was, or stabbed her with a knitting needle right in the belly. Jealousy it must have been eating her up. Going to stab a woman in the belly over jealousy? Jealous of what? And why in the belly? Oh, that woman's pregnant. She's being stabbed in the belly because someone is jealous of her being pregnant. Huh. So maybe there is some sort of reproduction crisis and viable live babies are at a premium. Like it's not easy to have them. If one woman in that situation were to get pregnant, I could imagine that a lot of other women might be jealous, especially if they live in a society that suddenly places a lot of value on people who can have children and no value on women who can't. Or tantalizingly, it was toilet cleaner she used, worked like a charm, though you'd think he'd have tasted it, must have been that drunk, but they found out all right. So it seems like many women in this situation aren't particularly happy. Some of them are poisoning their husbands or maybe their commanders or, or whatever. We're not sure yet, right? So most of that gossip does have to do with children and babies. It seems like being pregnant is enough to make some women murderously jealous. Is being able to have children somehow unique and special? Seems like it, right? Is there a problem with human reproduction? I don't know, maybe we'll find out. Also, it appears that some women, as we just saw, are lashing out, maybe in anger at being stuck in their new roles. And none of these things that you and I are talking about right now was said explicitly to you, the reader, because if we did that, we wouldn't be telling a story. We'd be writing an essay. In this world, children are at a premium and women are enslaved to make babies. Eh, you lose the story if you say it that way, right? So uh, instead, we find out this stuff, this exposition is delivered very artistically, very, very beautifully through events that would naturally play out in the story. Um, and to a degree, this type of showing and not telling is the very type of, of, of thing that I'm asking you guys to do. Uh, maybe not quite at this level, obviously, but uh, for this first essay assignment to describe a location in a way that your reader understands it in the way you do, even if they can't describe it uh, uh, inch for inch. But if you want them to like this place or hate this place or, or think this place is exciting or boring or scary or whatever, by the time they're done reading about it, you may not have have described it so they can so that they can draw a blueprint of it, but you've described it so that they feel the way you want them to feel about it. And you do that, as you can see from just the first couple of chapters, with this descriptive language, with figurative language like metaphors and uh, similes, personification. We're going to talk about some specific uses of, of that uh, in a later class to, to help prepare you guys. Um, but you, you heard about similes 
today. Um, and uh, by showing, not telling. So really good beginning of this chapter. It ties in really well with the, the first assignment that, I, that I'm asking you to do, almost like I planned it. Um, uh, so um, hopefully today's class will be helpful for you, not only understanding this text, but also showing you what to look for as you read through the text and also uh, acting as examples so that you can see how uh, good writers use figurative language to build images in readers' minds, to build, uh, to create emotional responses in their readers. It, it's, it's, it's a trick, it's, it's hard to do, but it's something that you can learn. It's something that the more you do, the better you get at it. And the, the better you get at that, the better a communicator you can be. When you're trying to write to uh, 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 someone in your office or, or, or you know, jot down information about a patient or something like that, your ability to express yourself clearly and concisely um, and effectively, or to use language effectively to reasonably or emotionally convince your audience that makes you a lot more of an effective person. Also, being able to recognize when someone's trying to do that to you is it makes you more effective as well. So all of this stuff that we're doing, particularly our reading right now, is practice for that. So hopefully what we're doing here is all coming together and starting to, to click. It's all starting to, to, you're recognizing that all of these things are kind of the same thing that we're dealing with. Um, we're going to keep reading uh, the text, but um, for today, we're done talking about chapters one and two. Um, like I said, hopefully uh, you guys are at least enjoying uh, the story and, and excited to see where it's going to go. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to class and, and hanging out. Um, have a great day. Stay safe, and um, I'll see you again soon. Bye, guys.